comment, and subscribe for more content. Where's the notification bell? It's to the right of you. Oh. What's up, guys? Welcome to this second part of our fandom-related podcast, more specifically titled You've Got a Friend in Me, the Pixar Podcast, here on a Funko Podcast. I am DK Wrestler. And I am MD Shady. And like I mentioned, it is part two of this Pixar podcast. And you guys definitely should check out part one if you have not yet, considering during that part we talked about the first 13 Pixar films, starting off with 1995's Toy Story and ended off with 2012's Brave. Talked about the movies and our opinions of them, plus the Funko Pops. But without further ado, we will talk about now the final 13 Pixar movies as of obviously this podcast and the Funko Pops involved with them, along with what Funko Pops we want to see next for the Pixar lineup. So Kicking off, first movie we're going to talk about is Monsters University, released June 21st, 2013, on a budget of $200 million, box office of $743.6 million, giving it a profit of $543.6 million, tomato ranking 80%. Audience score, 81%. When little Mike Wazowski went on to the scare floor, he wanted nothing more than to become a scare. Years later, he spends the rest of his days at Monsters University, but then meets a lazy student, James P. Sully Sullivan, who's way more of a scare than he is and is the family of famous scares. Then, Mike competes for the scare games, but little does he know he needs a fraternity. Soon, he has a team of four losers who are no good at anything. Then Mike has to be friendly to Sully when he joins their team. Now Mike and Sully have to win this in order to not just become the best of friends, but get themselves and their fraternity into the scare program. It's going to be a lot of hard work. Now, we did discuss both this movie and the Funko Pops involved with it in our Monsters, Inc. podcast we did last year, which is also another podcast, obviously, you guys should check out, which I will actually kick this off just like I mentioned about this movie in the podcast. Like the initials of Uzma Kappa, it was okay. It wasn't a bad prequel, but it did give us a decent story of how Mike and Sully met, and I did did like the amount of like twists and turns that are involved with this because you would think it'd end up being a happy ending where like they obviously get into the scare program, they go in the Monsters Inc., but they end up getting expelled because they basically cheat at the end of the movie and then they end up in the mail room and work their way up. Tomato ranking 80%, audience of 81. I'm going to go more towards audience just because it's a higher ranking because it's part of the Monsters franchise. It's a beloved franchise. And I would probably rank this like an 85 at most, maybe. It's interesting to see that the second movie for the Monsters franchise is actually a prequel rather than a sequel to Monsters, Inc. And when we got this movie, we didn't know about the Disney Plus series Monsters at Work. So now it makes a little bit more sense. It was an okay movie. It's nice to see how Mike and Sully uh, come about and how they meet. Yeah, overall, it was pretty good. Like DK said, there are some twists and turns with the movie. I don't think it compares anywhere near Monsters, Inc. And maybe even not even Monsters at Work. I really enjoyed Monsters at Work as well, but overall it wasn't a terrible movie and I think that the Rotten Tomatoes and the fan score of 80 and 81 makes a lot of sense. That's about where I'd put it, but I guess I will go with Rotten Tomatoes at 80. I think 80 makes sense to me. And as terms of the Funko Pops, there are only, I guess you can say five, two of them of which have had two different variants, Mike and Sully both having metallic variants and then a regular one. And then we had Randall from this set, which I mean, Randall was cool because we did not get a Randall pop in Monsters, Inc. And still to this day, even after talking about it a year ago, we still don't have a Randall Funko Pop. Yeah, it's weird to see the unnecessary metallic versions of Mike and Sully. I don't think those are needed by any means. The younger version of Randall, that's a pretty cool pop. All three of these pops are pretty decent, but I'm surprised that we didn't see a bigger wave with some of the other students from the movie. Next movie we're going to talk about is Inside Out, released June 19th, 2015, on a budget of $175 million, box office at $858.8 million, giving it a profit of $683.8 million, tomato ranking 98%. 
audience score 89 percent when a young girl named riley is uprooted from her midwestern lifestyle and moves to the busy and chaotic san francisco her emotions anger sadness disgust fear and her most important emotion joy start to disagree on how to deal with this dramatic change which causes problems up in headquarters the central living and working place for the five emotions but an accident involving riley's happy memories changes her entire outlook Joy and Sadness need to find her memories and return them to headquarters before it's too late. Such a whirlwind of emotions. I mean, no pun intended because of the characters involved. And it's literally Pixar at its best. We're kind of going right back up to where Pixar should be of their amazing movies, which I remember when I first watched this going into it. I had very low expectations. I didn't think it was going to be that good of a movie. Like I heard the plot. I'm like, okay, this is all right. But this is a movie for everyone. And this ended up being such a great movie and has you really thinking about like, oh man, like maybe there is like an angry thought in my mind, like with a flame head and wants to pull a lever of when I want to get mad or whatever. And like the whole concept of that movie and how there's like a whole different dimension of like what your mind is thinking of and there's islands of your personality, like it's such a unique concept. This movie easily is in my top 10, possibly top five best Pixar movies of all time. Something I also wanted to bring up is the recent announcement that there's going to be an Inside Out 2 movie that going to be happening and i'm a little iffy on it i think it will be decent but i don't know if it's going to be as great as this movie obviously and i'm not entirely sure what the plot is and i mean maybe if they actually go with the plot of what seems to be the teaser at the end of the movie where joy uh is looking at a certain button and she's like what's this button and it says puberty so if that's the case and it's still revolving around the character of Riley. And this is now going through her puberty stage, which obviously we've all been through and kind of can relate to. Then I think it may be a very decent movie when it comes out in, I believe, 2024, they announced it to be. Inside Out is a great movie. I don't know if I would regard it as my top five, maybe in the top 10, because it's like DK said, it's Pixar at its best. We get to see a great movie, which we haven't seen in a while at this point for Pixar. And it's just such an interesting idea for a movie. And Pixar is very good at making movies like this. Yeah, I'm excited to see about number two, because I do think there is potential for it to be a great movie. Probably not as good as Inside Out, the original, because yeah, that was a pretty darn good movie. So I don't know exactly where I would go with this one. I probably go with the fan rating for me i might go tomato so now for the funko pops which there is actually a pretty decent amount of funko pops made for this movie so first off we have ourselves joy the engine of the five emotions she keeps everyone moving and happy she represents the parts of riley that are starting to change and become more complicated and she is reluctant to let that change happen she may be the most positive but in many ways she is the least flexible there's obviously a common one and we have like a sparkle haired version that was a san diego comic-con 2015 exclusive sadness the voice of reason when joy has an idea she'll try to drag her down she appears to be depressed most of the time but there are a few instances where she is seen smiling and then there's also once again a sparkling hair version that was a san diego comic-con 2015 exclusive we got disgust which is very protective of riley she has high expectations of everyone around her and isn't very patient disgust is also very put together because appearances matter to her Fear protects Riley and keeps her safe. He is constantly on the lookout for potential disasters and spends time evaluating the possible dangers, pitfalls, and risks involved in Riley's everyday activities. There are a few activities and events that Fear does not find to be dangerous and possibly fatal. Anger. He's angry. He knows the group is well-meaning and they try hard, but they don't get how things should work as well as he does. So he has to stay on top of everything, and the only way he knows how to get their attention, keep it, and make sure they get things done right is by getting angry. He is comfortable with his anger. It makes him happy. But when pushed too far, the top of his head bursts into flames, which there are three versions of this pop. The first one is a regular version, as you guys are probably seeing on their screen right now. Then there is a flaming crystal version that is an Entertainment Earth exclusive. And then there is just a regular Flamehead version that's a San Diego Comic-Con 2015 exclusive. Bing Bong, which is Riley's adorable imaginary friend, creates 
created during her early childhood. However, as Riley grew older, she stopped playing with them, leaving Bing Bong out of a job and a bit lonely. And then there's also a translucent version of Bing Bong, which I'm pretty sure uh, it's supposed to be based off the fact that maybe he is invisible, he's imaginary, or I thought possibly it's when he starts dissolving because he does fall into the pit of like your memories disappearing. And then last but not least, we have a Disney Parks exclusive Rainbow Unicorn, an actress at Dream Productions, as she has starred in a dream sequence titled Fairy Dream Adventure Part 7. These are all pretty decent Funko Pops. I mean, I don't mind the sparkling effects for joy and sadness. I mean, I do like anger. That might be my favorite of the emotions as terms to this movie. And I do really like the San Diego Comic-Con version the best, just because it's kind of the in-between of the three different versions. Bing Bong, pretty funny that there's a pop of him. And then Rainbow Unicorn is so random. The pops for Inside Out are pretty decent for what they are. You have a good arrangement of characters. I don't necessarily think that we need more pops in this set. The Rainbow Unicorn definitely is an outlier of a pop that definitely did not have to be made, but it's not a bad pop by any means. I really do enjoy the San Diego Comic-Con 2015 anger. I'm glad to see that there's the two different versions of Bing Bong. The normal one is really cool. I like how that looks. And then they went with the same mold and just made it translucent. And that's big because, yeah, this definitely makes me think of when he starts to disappear in the movie because he is no longer part of Riley's memory. So, yeah, the, the, these are all pretty decent pops. If we did see some more Inside Out pops, I don't think it would be until we end up getting the second movie. All right. So the next movie we're going to be talking about is The Good Dinosaur, released November 25th, 2015 on a budget of between 175 to 200 million dollars with the box office being 332.2 million dollars which is approximately between 132.2 to 157.2 million dollars tomato ranking 76% audience score 64% after young Apatosaurus Arlo's father getting washed away by a flood, he blames a cave kid named Spot for killing him. Spot suddenly knocks Arlo into the river and Arlo gets washed away and gets lost in the woods. Arlo then later turns from scared to brave and he becomes friends with Spot. And Arlo then meets a clan of T-Rexes who find Arlo's way home. Can Arlo be the bravest little dinosaur or will he sometimes still be afraid? Good Dinosaur, I will admit, in my opinion, it is the second worst Pixar movie that has been made. What made it better than Cars 2 is that there was a bit of that Pixar emotional magic when there was not really any emotion from me at all watching Cars 2. Probably with the scene like near the end where he's like kind of using his head to push a spot to like the clan of cave people that are his family. But otherwise, it felt like a movie we've already seen before, like a land before time or something like that. So I actually only watched this movie last night. I never really had any intentions of watching it besides for this podcast. I didn't mind it. I don't think it was a bad movie, but it wasn't very good either. And it is like a movie we've seen before. And that movie is a Disney movie, a very beloved Disney movie. And that movie is called The Lion King. I mean, the whole movie is basically the same exact movie for a lot of different points with exactly what happens with Arlo's father, which was very easy to see coming, which kind of sucks. I kind of wish it was more of a, a shocking movie moment but i was like oh it's about to happen and it happens almost exactly like how it happens in the lion king and yeah i don't know it just it wasn't a great movie but i i didn't hate the movie i guess you could say tomato and audience score rankings ah uh, i i might have to go with audience at 64 yeah i would agree with that 64 seems about right like i didn't find it to be a terrible movie but it wasn't anything new that i haven't seen and as terms to the Funko Pops, there are only two, that being Arlo. We've already talked about it. He's a scared dinosaur and even doing stuff like trying to feed the chickens or trying to catch the critter, quote unquote, being Spot. And then Spot being a cave kid who is constantly stealing food from the dinosaurs and has been living out in the wilderness for the majority of his life. And I mean, I feel with this movie... These are the only two pops that should be made. I don't think there's really a necessary reason for them to continue making pops for this movie, especially for...
for how much of, I guess you can say a flop it was compared to the other ones as terms to making money in the box office, not even $200 million in the box office. It's pretty low for a Pixar movie nowadays, considering that the very first Toy Story movie made over $300 million in terms to profit. Yeah, these two pops aren't bad at all. I like how Arlo looks. I like the legs. The way they did them really encapsulates how he kind of stood and how he was kind of a janky little dinosaur. And then the spot, that's an okay pop. I mean, it also represents that character pretty well. All right, so the next movie we're going to talk about is Finding Dory. So for Finding Dory, released June 17, 2006, on a budget of $200 million, with the box office being $1.029 billion, making it the second Pixar movie to reach $1 billion, making a profit of $829 million. Tomato ranking, 94%. Audience score, 84%. The blue tank fish we have all grown to love returns along with her new family, Nemo and Marlin. However, when a field trip brings back some old memories of Dory's real family, she sets off on a journey across the ocean to California waters. With new friends like Hank the Septopus and Destiny the Whale Shark, Dory learns that her parents might be closer than she believes. I don't think it was a bad sequel, to be honest. I think it was something people might have actually wanted. But I don't think I felt as much emotions with this movie as I did with Finding Nemo. And I think it's mainly because in this case, it's not about losing a loved one. It's more of you randomly lost your friend. And I think you get more emotion out of a family member than you would have of a friend, especially when you have a character like Dory that is known to kind of like get lost a lot of times. And in this movie, I did enjoy some of the new characters like Destiny, as mentioned in the plot, and Bailey is also a character I really enjoyed also in that movie. And it's cool to see characters from the first movie back, like Crush that we got to see a little bit, the kids in the school, Mr. Ray. As terms to audience and tomato score, I gotta go with audience because no way in hell that this movie is a 90s movie, let alone a mid-90s movie. Uh, 84, maybe. It might even be just at the beginning of the 80s, possibly late 70s, in my opinion. I agree with that. Finding Dory wasn't bad, and I like the name of the movie. I think that it makes sense to call it Finding Dory. It really plays off of the first movie. I enjoyed the movie, but yeah, it didn't have that spark that the first movie had. Not a bad sequel, though, and yeah, definitely not ranked in the 90 percent that's for sure so i have to go with the fans on this one rather than rotten tomatoes there's only two pops involved in this movie and that is hank the septopus and then we have dory which is basically just a re-release of the original dory from finding nemo except they slapped a finding dory box instead of the finding nemo box the hank pop is pretty decent Felt like it could have pulled off having a chase where it was translucent because of being invisible and being able to blend in with whatever environment that Hank would be involved with. These two pops for Finding Dory definitely aren't bad. Dory makes sense. I mean, the movie is based around her to give us a Dory pop, but it isn't much different from the one that we had originally seen for Finding Nemo. And then the new character, Hank. I love this design of this pop. I love exactly how it looks. The coffee pot is an awesome hidden touch to this pop. Overall, two decent pops, but I feel like the wave could have been bigger. Next movie we have is Cars 3, released June 16th, 2017, on a budget of $175 million, with the box office at $383.9 million, giving it a profit of $208.9 million. Tomato ranking, 69%. Nice. Audience score, 69%. Nice. Lightning McQueen is happily winning all of his races until a new generation of high-tech racers are trained. They all zoom past McQueen, leaving him fading behind. Jackson Storm, a new gen, wins four times in a row as McQueen pushes himself too hard and crashes. In order to get back on the racetrack, he needs training from a young racing technician at Rusty's Racing Center, Cruz Ramirez. Cruz and Smokey Yunnick, the former engineer for the fabulous Hudson Hornet, help McQueen as best as they can. With cheering from Mater, Luigi, Guido, and Sally, McQueen could possibly beat Storm in the Florida 500 by learning a few tricks from the history of the fabulous Hudson Hornet. This wasn't a bad movie. It was probably okay at best. It definitely needed to be made after how 
bad Cars 2 was. And it was decent character development from Lightning McQueen. I feel like watching this movie, you can literally skip out Cars 2 and you're not missing anything. That's how bad Cars 2 was. With this, it was okay. There wasn't a lot of Mater in this movie, which is a little bit surprising. If you had added a little bit, some Mater magic there from the first movie into it, I think it would have been a little bit better. And then lastly, I wrote on my notes, please, for the love of God, don't make Cars 4. I can't really say what I like better as terms of tomato or audience because it's the same percent. So I guess 69%. Nice. Yeah, Cars 3 was definitely needed to be made to kind of save the Cars franchise after seeing Cars 2. And yeah, it wasn't a bad movie. It, it, it's decent. I definitely think that with more Mater, that definitely brings in the kids. So they definitely should have done that. Or maybe not even kids, but just people that want to see those funny moments from Mater. But yeah, overall, not bad. I think that 69% might be a little bit high, but not by much. So yeah, got to go with both at 69%. Nice. So for this movie, there actually was a decent amount of pops. We have a few Lightning McQueen's regular one. We got a metallic version that was a Target exclusive. And we also have a silver version that was exclusive to Majir, I think it's pronounced, which this is him with the silver coating after the big crash and that it was the silver coating before he was being repainted. Then we got ourselves a fabulous Hudson Hornet version of Lightning McQueen that was a Toys R Us exclusive, which is Lightning's big tribute to Doc Hudson at the end of of the movie. Crew is the trainer of the new Rusty's training center. She dreams of being a race car, which Lightning gives her the opportunity by having her finish the race for him. Then we got ourselves Luigi, an Italian 1959 Fiat 500 that owns a tire shop in Radiator Springs. And we got Guido, a Tutto forklift that assists Luigi at a shop, Luigi's Casa della Tires. Really surprised we didn't get Luigi and Guido in the first wave of Cars pops, and I'm surprised there wasn't any other characters from Cars that could have been made at this point also. I'm not surprised there's a bunch of Lightning McQueens. Really enjoyed the fabulous Hudson Hornet Lightning McQueen. That might be my favorite, although the metallic version of the regular one for the set is really cool also. Cruise definitely makes sense. Could there be more pops? Possibly, but I wouldn't be mad if we don't get any pops ever or anytime soon for this movie. Yeah, not surprised about the abundance of Lightning McQueen's. He obviously is the money draw when it comes to merchandising for the Cars franchise. I do feel like the common Lightning McQueen is just a little too similar to the original one that we've seen. It does look nicer, but I don't think it was needed. They probably could have skipped out on just that pop and kept the metallic and the two other color variations. And then, yeah, we got Luigi and Guido, which, yeah, I don't know why these weren't in the first lineup too awesome characters that are pretty much so different from any other character in the Cars franchise, but I am glad that we got to see them with Cars 3. Next movie, we have the reason we are even doing a Pixar podcast because this movie celebrates its five-year anniversary this year. It's Coco, released November 22nd, 2017 on a budget of $175 to $125 million with the box office of $807.8 million, making a profit of approximately $582.8 to $632.8 million. Tomato ranking, 97%. Audience score, 94%. Rebellious Miguel, a 12-year-old Mexican boy and hopeful musician, can't understand the family's continuing ban on all music, especially when his icon and greatest guitar player ever, the deceased Ernesto de la Cruz, is the town's hero. However, when an inadvertent mistake on the sacred day of the dead magically transports Miguel to the distant and bustling land of the dead, the scoundrel skeleton Hector will lead the way through the vibrant underworld to help the young trespasser find a missing ancestor. But can they do it before sunrise? Oh my god, this movie has... It's such a great concept for a movie. It's so fantastic with so many twists and turns for the plot that you just weren't expecting. And easily, this is in my top five favorite Pixar movies of all time. This movie is so great. This movie pulled my heartstrings on a whole different level. I watched Toy Story 3 and I got so emotional when you've seen the scene with Andy. And then you got Inside Out and my eyes almost started watering with the scene near the end with Riley but this movie especially when Miguel starts playing remember me I bawled my eyes out 
And that never happens in like any movie. So for Coco to make me literally ball my eyes out, even when rewatching it, is props to Coco. And normally a lot of movies, they become so great that we want a sequel to them. But this movie, all in caps lock, as I wrote in my notes, don't make a sequel. Yeah, Coco is nothing shy of fantastic. It's a great movie. I had heard good things about it, and then I had watched it, I don't know how long ago, maybe two years ago. Wow, I was blown away by this movie. It's the colors in this movie, the story, the music, the twists and turns. Everything about this movie is great. This is definitely in my top five list. I feel like me and DK have a very similar top ten list for Pixar, uh, especially when you get down to the top five. Uh, Coco is definitely in there. I don't know if it's five or number four, but... Yeah, it's such a beautiful movie. I wouldn't be surprised if one day they do make a sequel. I don't think we need it because I can't see them making a movie that is better than this first version of Coco. Tomato ranking and audience score. I got to go with tomato ranking at 97. It is literally at lowest mid 90s. Yeah, I have to agree with that exactly. 97 makes a lot of sense. I wouldn't say it's any lower than 95%. So the Funko Pops involved here, there are 10 Funko Pops with one being basically brand new announced within the last week or so before recording this pod. So first off, we have a regular Miguel, which also has a chase version that is the human version instead of obviously him being the Land of the Dead version. A glow-in-the-dark Miguel that is a Toys R Us exclusive of that version, and then a Diamond Collection that was a Hot Topic exclusive. Ernesto, a famous singer and musician who dazzled audiences with his good looks and his charm. Ernesto was the sort of Mexican pride due to his handsome looks, strong morals, and his standing up for his fellow Mexicans. He was also thought to be Miguel's great-great-grandfather as well. After his sudden death from being crushed by a giant bell during the performance, he resides as a soul in the land of the dead. Hector, later revealed as the father of Coco and was a songwriter for Ernesto before being poisoned by him due to wanting to spend time with his family. As he was being forgotten by Grandma Coco, he needs help from Miguel to put his photo on the altar in order to be remembered and also help Miguel to escape the land of the dead. Hector is mischievous and loves to play tricks, but he also has a well-disposed and warm-hearted nature. Then we got ourselves Miguel with Guitar, which was a WonderCon 2020 shared with Box Lunch Exclusive. This is when obviously Miguel plays guitar on stage in the Land of the Dead. A glow-in-the-dark six-inch Pepita, which is a Box Lunch Exclusive. It's an imposing Alabrige who functions as a sort of spiritual guide for Emelda. She cannot speak. Instead, she only makes animal-like roars and noises. A glow-in-the-dark Alabrige Dante, which is a box lunch exclusive. Dante was a stray dog who's extremely loyal to Miguel due to the boy's kindness and the Riveras as a whole. Dante has a weakness towards food as it led Miguel to embarrassing situations in the film. Although Dante is goofy and simple-minded, it is shown that he is smarter than he looks. And last but not least, the last pop that was just recently announced, and it's for this set, is the -the glow-in-the-dark Miguel playing guitar that is a box lunch exclusive. And this is where Miguel is playing the guitar and the leaves go up. He ends up in the land of the dead. So with these Coco Funko Pops, I mean, the Miguel, it's pretty cool. I mean, you got the common and then you got the chase. I mean, it makes sense for to have a human and then the non-human, I guess you can say. And I like how with the skeleton version, his hands are in his sweater pocket, but then with the human version, his arms are crossed. And I mean, did we need a glow-in-the-dark version and a diamond collection version to be released for the set? Not really. I mean, there was a lot of cool characters that also should have been made into pop form that wasn't instead of making specification versions for Miguel here. And the Ernesto and Hector pops are really awesome also with their head sculpts. I felt like with Hector, he could have had a better posing for his pop. But nonetheless, I mean, Ernesto is really cool with his guitar also. Miguel with the guitar for the Land of the Dead, that's pretty sweet. And then you have the Box Lunch Glow in the Dark exclusives, which 
are really cool with the six inch pepita and then you have the alabrige dante which i was really surprised that they made this as just its standalone pop because i felt like they would have made just regular dante and then made the alabrige version as its chase which would have been wicked it would have been one of the best common chase bundles that you could probably get even if it was still a box launch exclusive and then the brand new miguel playing guitar glow in the dark pop exclusive the box launch we kind of discussed about this i believe it was last week or the week before on our podcast and didn't go to too much info because we were saving it for this pod and I think it's a great looking pop. I like the idea of the leaves kind of flowing there because when he's in that like little chapel or cathedral where Ernesto's guitar is hanging and he does one strum and then the leaves kind of fall all over the place or just kind of go up in the air and they all glow also because he needs the leaf to get back to the real world. Yeah, this is an awesome set of pops. There's a good variety and a lot of different Miguels if that's what you want to collect. Starting off with the normal Miguel, this is pretty cool. And then the Chase version being his human form. I think that that is awesome. And it's a completely different uh, mold with the body and the head, which is cool to see from a Chase because we don't get that a ton nowadays with Funko. The glow in the dark and the glitter, I don't think are necessarily needed for both of them. Maybe one or the other, but both I just think is a little much. The Ernesto is one of my favorites. I really enjoy how that pop turned out. Hector's really cool as well, but like DK said, there probably could have been some better posing considering he's a very energetic character and definitely had a lot of cool different poses and dances that he did throughout the movie. I really enjoy the Miguel with the guitar. I think that is maybe one of the best Coco Pops. It's simplistic, but gets the point across, and that's what I like with a lot of Pops. The Glow in the Dark Pepita is pretty sweet as well. There's a lot of detail that goes into that pop with all the different colorways, which is great. And then the Dante as well is pretty sick, but I do love DK's thought on if there would have been a regular Dante and then have this as a chase. That'd been one of the craziest chases we've ever seen. And then last but not least, we have the newest Miguel with the leaves and... I had briefly mentioned on the pod that I didn't like this pop, and the reason for that is because I think this could have been done better. I would have liked to see this as a deluxe pop where he's actually in, like, the room that he was in when this happened, and you could have, like, the picture of Ernesto behind him and stuff like that. I think it would have been a lot better, but I can't wait to see the glow on this. Next movie we're talking about is Incredibles 2, released June 15th, 2018, on a budget of $200 million, and the box office being $1.243 billion, making a profit of $1.043 billion, the most profitable Pixar movie to date as of the recording of this podcast, tomato ranking 93%. Audience score 84%. While the Parr family has accepted its collective calling as superheroes, the fact remains that their special heroism is still illegal. After they are arrested after unsuccessfully trying to stop the Underminer, their future seems bleak. However, the wealthy Dever siblings of DevTech offer new hope with a bold project to rehabilitate the public image and legal status of supers, with Elastigirl being assigned on point to be the shining example. Having agreed for now to stay home to look after the kids, Mr. Incredible finds domestic life a daunting challenge, especially when baby Jack-Jack's newly emerged powers make him almost impossible to manage. However, Elastigirl has her own concerns dealing with the menace of a new supervillain screen slayer who is wreaking havoc with his mind control abilities elastigirl must solve the mystery of this enemy who has designs on the world with the par family and friends key targets of this evil i thought this was a good sequel especially one that we waited 14 years for because the first one came out in 2004 this is now 2018 i think a lot of people did want an incredibles 2 because there were some unanswered questions by the end of the movie like what are jack jack's powers i mean we've seen some of them when he's in the sky with syndrome but the parents didn't even know about jack jack having powers because looking up so high in the sky didn't even know that was happening does violet end up getting that date with tony and what happens after the battle with the Underminer? Because that's how the movie ended for the first one is that battle with the Underminer. And that's how it kicks off for the second movie. So really enjoyed that they kind of did that as terms to the timeline is that it's right after the events. Uh, and some can argue that this movie is better than the first one. Some people think it's 
not as great as the first one. I think the first one is still a bit better, not neck and neck close like Toy Story 1 and 2, but I think out of all the movies with sequels, I think this is the closest to having their sequel being maybe as good as the first or possibly better. Yeah, I really enjoyed Incredibles 2. I mean, like DK had said, 14 years we waited for a sequel, which is a decent amount of time to wait, but at the same time, Pixar movies do take forever to make. And yeah, I thought it was a perfect sequel. I didn't really see many flaws in this movie for uh, sequel wise, at least when I went to see it, I saw it in theaters, which I don't usually do with a lot of Pixar movies, but I went on a double date to watch this movie and all four of us really enjoyed the movie uh, and we had a great time, which is exactly what you want to see out of a movie. We were all nostalgic about it with the first movie that we had all loved. And then we got this one and I liked the new characters that we see brought into this movie. I think that that is a good touch and we get to finally see like what's going on with the Incredibles and what they are doing. And of course, seeing Frozone on the screen again was awesome to see. So yeah, Overall, I really enjoyed it, and I do think it is one of those sequels that are basically neck and neck with the original, but the original does have that nostalgicness to it, so it is a little bit of a better movie, in my opinion. And as terms to the Rotten Tomato and audience scores... Maybe tomato, but I don't, but I think it's because I would rate it a high 80. So that low 90 is closer than essentially a little bit close to early 80s with the audience score. Yeah, I would have to go with Rotten Tomatoes because I really enjoyed it. And I think it's basically right around the same score as the first movie. And for the Funko Pop set. This is probably the biggest set we're going to be talking about out of both of the parts of the Pixar podcast. So starting off with Mr. Incredible, the new version we kind of teased about in the first part of the podcast, Elastigirl, new version. But then we have new characters here like Violet, which also has a translucent chase, the daughter and eldest child of Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl, sister of Dash and Jack-Jack. She is the power of invisibility and uses a force shield. Dash, the son and middle child of Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl and brother of of Violet and Jack-Jack. He has the power of being able to run at a really fast speed. Jack-Jack, the son and youngest child of Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl and brother of Violet and Dash. Jack-Jack has polymorphism, the ability to change into different forms such as being completely on fire, monster form, metal form, and more. Then we have a Jack-Jack variant of one of his powers, which is the Silver Chrome Head exclusive to Hot Topic. We got Frozone having his first Funko Pop, also known as Lucius Best, a longtime friend of Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl, has the power of Cryokinesis, which is the ability to turn things into ice, Screen Slayer, an antagonist, and is created by Evelyn Dever to control people in a hypnotic state. Underminer, an antagonist that ended off the first movie and kicked off the second movie, who has a big drill vehicle and digs underground. Then we have a bunch of Jack-Jack versions, Monster Jack-Jack exclusive to the Funko Shop, Fire Jack-Jack that was exclusive to Target, a stretch version of Elastigirl, which is a Target exclusive, Back to the Jack-Jacks, it's Edna Jack-Jack that was a San Diego Comic-Con 2018 shared with Amazon exclusive, Jack-Jack in Diaper, which was an FYE exclusive, a 10-inch Jack-Jack that was a Target exclusive, Void, which was an Emerald City Comic-Con 2019 shared with Walmart exclusive, one of the second-rate superheroes who has the power of dimensional teleportation, and last but not least, we have Elastigirl on Elastacycle Pop Rides, which is Elastigirl with her motorcycle that she uses that can split into two when she stretches out. I mean, pretty big set of Funko Pops. I feel like this would be very overwhelming to try to get this set. Obviously, the Mr. and Mrs. Incredibles are really awesome with their new molds compared to the original ones. Getting the kids in Funko Pop form are really cool. And I'm not surprised about Jack-Jack getting an abundance of Funko Pops because I feel like this was how the movie was so popular and how it became as a factor the most profitable Pixar movie yet is that huge thing of people wondering about Jack-Jack and especially with the different forms, Monster Jack-Jack, Fire Jack-Jack. So they did them all pretty well in Funko Pop form. The Void Pop was really unexpected and I think that would be the one and only 
I guess as it's titled here, second rate superhero I'd want to see. I don't really care about the other ones, but Void was pretty cool. And then the Elastigirl and Elastocycle was a pop that I remember seeing at our local GameStop for so long. And I think it actually recently was bought by someone. So, I mean, kudos to whoever bought it because it's been sitting there since literally 2018 when the set came out. This is a set of pops that I've been contemplating collecting because of how awesome it is. But it, like DK said, it is a big set. So it is. It has been a little overwhelming for me, and I haven't even started to collect any of them, which is unfortunate because I really do want to at least get the majority of this set because they are done so well, starting with Mr. Incredible. What a great way to do Mr. Incredible Pop. Way better than that original one we've seen. Next, we have Elastigirl, and I didn't really have too many complaints about the first one, but this one is done a lot better. And then we finally have Pops of some of the kids, well, all of the kids, but Violet in her common, as well as the chase version being translucent. I think that's great and makes a lot of sense. We have the one version of Dash, which is pretty cool. I would like to see maybe more in the future, but this is a good version and I like the way the pose is. And then we have the abundance of Jack Jacks, which makes a lot of sense. I'm glad that they made these different versions. They're all good in their own way. And especially that Edna one, uh, what a funny moment in that. So I think it's interesting that they, they made this into a pop. I think it easily could have just been the chase version of that FYE exclusive where he's just in his diaper, considering it is practically the same mold with the body. And then just the head swap could be the chase version. And then we have obviously some of the other characters with Frozone finally getting his own pop, which looks sweet. This is a pop that I've really wanted to get, and I don't believe I own it. And then we have the Screen Slaver, which is a decent pop, but seems like one of those shelf sitters. And then the Underminer, which has a lot of really cool detail with him. The Void, which I loved this announcement of the Void. I thought this pop was super awesome looking, and I still don't own it, but I do plan on it one day. And then lastly, Elastigirl on the Elasticycle. This is pretty sweet. I like how they executed this pop. It looks great. I don't know why I never picked this up. Next movie we're going to be talking about is Toy Story 4, released June 21st, 2019 on a budget of $200 million in the box office of $1.073 billion, making a profit of $873 million. Rotten Tomato ranking 97%. Audience score of 94%. Woody, Buzz Lightyear, and the rest of the gang embark on a road trip with Bonnie and her new toy named Forky. The adventurous journey turns into an unexpected reunion as Woody's slight detour leads him to his long-lost friend Bo Peep. As Woody and Bo discuss the old days, they soon start to realize that they are two worlds apart when it comes to what they want from life as a toy. Not surprised that a fourth film was made, not because of the fact that the third movie made so much money, but I mean, the way it ended, you could have made it so that's like, all right, it's the toys with the new owner. I did like some of the new characters like Duke Kaboom. I somewhat liked Gabby Gabby, but it was weird to see characters like Jesse, Rex, Ham, and a lot of the supporting toys, I guess you can say, that were in the previous films not really be featured much. But I mean, for Mr. Potato Head, it was understandable because his voice actor, Don Rickles, passed away shortly. I think it was after the first set of recordings for the movie. So they had to like take recordings that they already recorded or archived recordings from the previous films and add them to the movie so they couldn't have Mr. Potato Head all that much. And then, like I mentioned about this film in the Toy Story pod, I'm not sure if I want to see a Toy Story 5 be made and I just kind of want to see spinoffs, which we do get one spinoff that we will discuss about later on. But overall, it was still a pretty great movie. I would have to go with the tomato ranking over the audience score, considering first movie being 100%, like I mentioned in part one, Toy Story 2 being 99, in my opinion, Toy Story 3 being 98, which was the tomato ranking, and then 1% less for the fourth one at 97. Toy Story 4 was pretty awesome. It wasn't really what I was expecting. I watched it three times in 24 hours, and every single time I watched it, I bawled my eyes out, like, uncontrollably. It was a little bit ridiculous for a grown man to do, but at 
the same time, I really have this love for Toy Story. And this one definitely pulls your heartstrings. It was a good movie overall. I don't think it was as good as one or two and even three. But I do like what they did with it. But I am kind of craving a fifth movie to see what else can happen. But I'm not mad at seeing spinoffs in between that time because... I feel like there's a lot of money that could be made with different spinoffs in the Toy Story franchise because there's a lot of characters, especially with Buzz and Woody and Jesse and Zerg and all these different characters that could have their own spinoff type things. I will go with Rotten Tomatoes because it's Toy Story and it has to rank super high for me. As turns to the pops, we already discussed about a lot of them on the Toy Story pod, but that overall set I think is just as big or maybe even bigger than Incredibles 2. And I'm only going to mention three pops. First, Duke Boom. I think that pop looks awesome. The new version of Alien, which was desperately needed because of how bad the original one looked. And then the newer Jesse pop, which the original one wasn't too bad, but this one was a big improvement from the original one. Yeah, Toy Story 4 definitely did have a pretty big wave of pops, which I think was great. I like collecting them. I like seeing them. And there were some cool ones. Uh, For example, the flocked bunny and flocked ducky, I think, were really cool. You get the common variants or you can get these flocked ones, which I think are a lot better because it makes sense. They're fluffy carnival toys. Why not be flocked? And then, yeah, Duke Kaboom is definitely one that needs to be mentioned because that is a sweet pop and a really cool character that me and DK both enjoyed a lot. Next movie we're going to talk about is Onward, released March 6, 2020, with a budget of $175 to $200 million, box office $142 million, meaning that it lost money at the box office, tomato ranking 88%, audience score 95%. In a suburban fantasy world, two teenage elf brothers, Ian and Barley Lightfoot, go on a journey to discover if there is still a little magic left out there in order to spend one last day with their father, who died when they were too young to remember him. Like any good quest, their journey is filled with magical spells, cryptic maps, impossible obstacles, and unimaginable discoveries. When the boy's fearless mom, Laurel, realizes that her sons are missing, she teams up with the legendary winged lion scorpion former warrior, the man and heads off to find them. Perilous curses aside, this one magical day could mean more than any of them ever dreamed. I did not know until like I kind of recognized the voices and researching that Ian and Barley respectively are voiced by Tom Holland and Chris Pratt. And this wasn't bad of a movie. It's not in one of my favorites list. Like I don't think it's a top 10 and I don't know if it's even mid tier. I think it's in that like bottom 10 if you're ranking all 26, but in maybe the middle, maybe part of the top to where it could escape eventually when there is more Pixar movies and a new bottom 10. It's still not a bad storyline. Pretty cool for expanding into what seems to be more of a Dungeons and Dragons story for a Pixar movie. I don't think this movie was bad. I think it could have been better. I really liked the concept for the storyline of how the boys haven't really grown to know their father and they're trying to go out there and finally get that last day with him. I really enjoyed that. It felt like the movie kind of dragged on a little bit. I'm not sure what the runtime was on it, but it just felt like it kind of just kept going. And I really wanted to get to some of those good parts kind of near the end. I would also put it in my like bottom 10 for Pixar, but I don't think it was bad. Pixar just really doesn't make bad movies besides movies like Cars 2. As terms of the Funko Pops, we don't have that big of a lineup, which, I mean, it definitely makes sense. First off, we have Ian Lightfoot, a young blue elf that lives at home with his mother, Laurel, and his older brother, Barley. It is revealed early in the film that Ian and Barley's father, Wilden, passed away while Laurel was pregnant with Ian and while Barley was very young. Having never met his father, Ian thinks about him all the time. Barley Lightfoot, a rowdy yet compassionate elf that accompanies his brother Ian in getting the other half of their late father back after a spell to bring him back to life for 24 hours goes awry. Then we got Wilden Lightfoot, the late father of Barley and Ian. When Ian uses his spell to bring him back to life, only the bottom half of himself appears. When the Phoenix Gem blows up, this makes Ian create a top half and keeps him on a leash. The Manticore, which is a beast with many powers such as fire breath, strength, and paralyzing venom. However, she lives in modern times as an owner of a Manticore restaurant. 
the unicorn pops, which have a glitter chase exclusive to Hot Topic. And then we have Warrior Barley, which was an Amazon exclusive, which was a part of a like 10 to 13 second scene. And I mean, for the pops, these aren't that bad. I mean, you have regular versions of Ian and Barley. Manticore is really cool. And especially Wilden with his Weekend at Bernie's vibes going on was really cool to make in Funko Pop form. The unicorn, pointless to make, but that warrior barley, I don't know, maybe that shouldn't have been made either, especially because I believe, like a lot of Amazon exclusives, it ended up being a site sitter and was like at least 50% off at some point after it was released. These pops aren't bad. I like the detail with them. When I seen the pops, it made me interested in watching the movie, which is always a good thing, but I didn't end up watching the movie until just a few days ago in preparation for this pod. But overall, yeah, these, these pops do look good. The unicorn is a little bit pointless and one of the worst chase pops that we've ever seen with basically just the horn being changed in colors and glitter, which is such a slight difference. And I don't feel like that's a chase that many people were actually chasing to get. All right, moving on to the next movie. It's Soul, released December 25th, 2020, Christmas Day. Budget of $150 million, box office at $121 million. Tomato ranking, 95%. Audience score, 88%. More than anything in this world, Joe Gardner, a talented pianist who lives and breathes jazz, wants to get his big break. Instead, after nailing a make-or-break audition with New York City's legend saxophonist Dorothea Williams, ecstatic Joe finds himself fighting for his life, trapped in a mythical plane of existence between the world and the next, life and death. There, at the dreamy celestial nursery of unborn souls, Joe gets the chance to reevaluate his life and maybe, just maybe, inspire others to find their purpose and passion in life, their spark, but poor Joe isn't ready to cross over yet. What does it take to live life to the fullest? This is a movie where it has you really thinking about life. Like, it makes you think, like, what could happen in the afterlife, I guess it would be. It has you really thinking compared to a lot of the Pixar movies. I did enjoy it for the aspects of it being music-themed, because obviously I play music. I don't think it's a 95. Maybe I will agree with the audience score, because I do think maybe at least it is a high 80s. Yeah, this is a pretty good movie. I'm going to have to rewatch it again to get more of a fill in on it, but I definitely did watch it. And when I watched it, I really did enjoy it. Like DK said, it really gets you thinking about what could be out there after this life that we live. If you are like a religious person or if you believe in anything of that kind of sort, it was very different from anything we've seen with Pixar. And I think that it was a good thing. It was a very refreshing movie. If anything, I don't know exactly where I'd put this on my list, but I would probably go with the audience rating over Rotten Tomatoes. And I actually just realized, I think we forgot to mention to do that for Onward. So I guess I'll mention that was 88 for Tomato and audience for 95. I'd have to go with Tomato at this point with 88. Yeah, I would also go with Tomato and I would probably put it a little bit lower than that, maybe around the 75% mark, honestly. So the Funko Pops involved with Soul, we got a regular Joe Gardner. I don't have to go into description about him because I mentioned that in the plot. Mr. Mittens, which is a therapy cat that laid beside Joe while in the hospital, but was accidentally taken over by Joe when he was able to be sent back to Earth. The Soul World version of Joe Gardner, when he is basically a, I guess, ghost or a soul. 22, a soul who has spent hundreds of years at the U Seminar, where new souls must meet several requirements before going to Earth. Like every soul before her, 22 has been through the personality pavilions which explains her endearing sarcasm quick wit and occasional moodiness she meets every requirement to go to earth except one but no matter how many visits she makes to the hall of everything no matter how many esteemed luminaries have mentioned her she can't find the spark she needs to fulfill her requirements to make her way to earth that's fine with 22 the truth is she's not interested in life on earth at all and then we got a glow in the dark version that was a Barnes and Noble exclusive of 22. Soul World Moonwind, which is a person with the ability of mystic powers, where he is able to send people back to Earth in a way that it's not supposed to be and helps a lot of souls get over their obsessions. In the real world, Moonwind works as a sign spinner for a store that is owned by his mother a soul world Mr. Mittens, and then we have a grinning 22. As terms of these pops, the Joe Gardner 
pretty decent. I mean, it would have been cool if they made a deluxe where he's playing his piano. Mr. Mittens is pretty cool. I mean, this is a pretty awesome scene where he snags the slice of pizza. And I think it definitely made sense for them to make a Mr. Mittens pop. Soul World Joe, pretty decent. Same with 22, both versions, Glow in the Dark and Regular. Moonwind was surprised that there was only a Soul World and not a regular one where he's holding the sign. That was pretty surprising. Mr. Mittens, I think the Soul World version could have been taken out of this lineup because you literally only see Mr. Mittens for three seconds and it's just a pan shot of Mr. Mittens going on the conveyor belt to the afterlife and that's all you see so there wasn't really a point this is an interesting lineup of pops and I like it. I like how these soul versions of each of these characters look the way that they went about having it with this weird kind of colorway. And I think that it translated into pop form very well. I do really enjoy the human version of Joe. I think that that's an awesome looking pop where he has this kind of narrow looking head and doesn't really have the normal sized or shaped head that we see with Funko Pops. Next movie we're going to talk about is Luca, released June 28th, 2021, and there was no budget listed. Box office was $49.8 million. Tomato ranking, 92%. Audience score, 86%. Young Luca and his best friend Alberto summon up the courage to visit the picturesque fishing village of Porto Rosso. However, the boys share and hide a great secret. They are not ordinary children, but harmless sea monsters who live underwater, eager to find out what lies above the sea's surface. Long before, adventure after adventure and experience after experience, the two wide-eyed explorers will discover the true meaning of freedom, the importance of family, and the catalytic power of acceptance. This movie was not as bad as people say it is. I've seen it twice now, once when it first came out on Disney Plus last year, and then once while preparing for this podcast. I think a lot of the characters were really enjoyable compared to a lot of the Pixar movies, and I really enjoyed the animation style and how the way that I put it is that the characters look like really excellent quality claymation. It might still be on the bottom 10, but not so far off of being close to being a mid-tier movie. Yeah, I mean, I guess there really isn't much for me to say because DK definitely summed up exactly what I was going to say. Uh, definitely bottom 10, but closer to the top. Better than I expected. Not amazing, but not bad at all. The colors in this movie were very vibrant and DK nailed it by saying that it was like a high quality claymation. I really enjoyed the way that the characters looked in this movie. So with the Rotten Tomato ranking and the audience score 92 and 86, I probably will have to go with audience score of 86. I think it would be maybe high 70s, early 80s, possibly, but more maybe high 70s. Yeah, I have to go with the audience on this one as well. I'd probably put it around a 70%. So the audience isn't too far off. All right. So for the Funko Pops, it's not a big set. And that's not a bad thing either with a lot of these sets. So first off, we have Julia Marcovaldo, an Italian teenage girl staying with her father Massimo in Porto Rosso for the summer. She befriends Luca and Alberto and tries to help them win the Porto Rosso Cup. Luca and Alberto in land form, which Luca obviously a sea monster that is influenced by his newfound best friend Alberto Scarfano to venture into the surface. Once he discovers his parents will send him to the deep away from the surface he and Alberto's escape to the town of Porto Rosso Italy and enter the Porto Rosso Cup so they can buy a Vespa and see the world together Alberto a sea monster that lives on Isola del Mar an Italian island with no parental guardian Alberto helps Luca escape to Porto Rosso and enter the Porto Rosso Cup so they can buy a Vespa and see the world together and then there's also the sea monster versions of Luca and Alberto which Overall in this lineup, I think these were like a perfect wave. I don't think besides one character, which would be Massimo, that I think that they didn't need to make more pops of. Adding that whole like high quality claymation style uh, into pop form is really cool. It gives me the vibes of like how Funko, I felt like could not pull off Rick and Morty pops very well unless they had the mouse, which is what they did with these pops. And they look really awesome, especially Alberto with his simplistic pose. 
Yeah, this is a cool set of pops. I like how they added the mouths. It doesn't take away from the pop style at all. It only enhances it with characters such as these ones. And like DK had said, with the Rick and Morty. And I do think it is a pretty perfect wave with five pops. All right, here we go. Turning Red released March 11th, 2022 on a budget of $150 million and the box office at $20.1 million. Tomato ranking 95%. Audience score, 72%. Mei Lin is a confident, dorky 13-year-old torn between staying her mother's dutiful daughter and the chaos of adolescence. Her protective, if not slightly overbearing mother, Ming, is never far from her daughter, an unfortunate reality for the teenager. As if changes of her interests, relationships, and body weren't enough, whenever she gets too excited, which is practically always, she poofs into a giant red panda. First thing I wrote in my notes, I don't think this is a 90s movie at all, but I don't agree with low 70s either. This is a movie where when I watched it for the first time, once again, when it released on Disney Plus earlier this year, I thought it was a pretty great movie, but then I watched it a second time and it kind of gave me the feeling of like, if anyone remembers, and I know MD obviously knows this show, of Wizards of Waverly Place and there was the episode of to the max and they go to eat the sandwich and it's like you eat the sandwich the first time it tastes pretty great but the more times you eat that sandwich it becomes less amazing than it was the first time so i felt like there was a distance between like i thought it was amazing the first time but i don't think it was amazing the second time that i watched the movie once again it is a bottom 10 film but nonetheless i still did enjoy it because of obviously this whole movie taking place in canada uh, more specifically in Toronto where we're pretty close to and so many homages that they did for Ontario more specifically I mean they showed off Canadian money with the blue five dollar bills loonies and toonies they had referred to the Sky Dome, which because the movie takes place in 2002, it makes sense that it's called the Sky Dome because it was called that until 2005 when it was renamed the Rogers Center. So really like that little aspect. Tomato and audience score. I got to go with audience score. I don't know what I would rate this as terms to a number. Maybe it's somewhere in the 70s, I have to say. I don't think it's an 80s movie either. When we first started getting announcements and trailers for this movie, I was pretty excited to watch it due to the fact that it does take place in Toronto and it seemed like there would be a lot of different homages and hints to different things that uh, take place in Toronto or in Canada in general. So I was pretty excited to watch it and then I did watch it and boy did I love this movie a lot more than I thought I was going to. Uh, I thought it was really good. Really enjoyed this. It's a lot different than some other Pixar movies and it was funny. It had a really good message behind it. It was a little bit intense in some parts, which was really cool. And it was also awesome to see Canada represented in a company like Pixar, where I don't think we've ever seen anything close to that. Audience or Rotten Tomatoes? I have to go with Rotten Tomatoes, but I do think that that's a little bit high. I would probably put this around an 89%. I really did enjoy this movie. As terms of the Funko Pops, we only have three pops in this set. Maylin Lee, 13-year-old girl, obviously, who has the ability to transform into the Red Panda whenever she feels a strong emotion. And then two versions of the Red Panda May, where one is a regular version and the other is a flocked version exclusive to the Funko Shop, which both are six-inch figures. And I think this is a lineup where I am perfectly fine with just these pops. The main focus, obviously, is on Maylin and then, obviously, her Red Panda form. I somewhat agree with what DK said there. These pops are good. You have obviously Maylin and then the Red Panda, which is exactly what you want to see. I either think that there shouldn't be any more pops or there should be a lot more pops. We should see all the friends. We should see a four pack of Four Town and maybe some other different variants of some characters. All right, here we go. The final film for Pixar at the moment, the 26th film, and that is Lightyear. Released June 17th, 2022, with a budget of $200 million and the box office at $226.2 million, making only a profit of $26.2 million. Tomato ranking, 75%. Audience score, 84%. Legendary Space Ranger Buzz Lightyear embarks on an intergalactic adventure alongside ambitious recruits Izzy, Moe, 
Darby, and his robot companion, Socks. As this motley crew tackles their toughest mission yet, they must learn to work together as a team to escape the evil Zerg and his dutiful robot army that are never far behind. First off, there is a lot of things I want to talk about with this movie. First off, a lot of factors of why it only made just over $26 million, making it pretty much somewhat of a flop compared to a lot of movies. Uh, I think first off, spinoffs don't make as much money as main feature films. If this was, let's say, Toy Story 5, I think with the marketing behind it, I think it definitely would have had more people in seats going to see this movie. Another one, uh, obviously, you got to go with the fact that a lot of people were not liking the idea of Chris Evans being Buzz Lightyear instead of Tim Allen. But I have always said this, and I will continue to say this, is that I was not mad at the decision of Tim Allen not being Buzz Lightyear in this movie. And that's because... Because whenever you see movies and then they make merchandise opportunities for it afterwards, and especially it involves voice acting, usually the actor who plays a certain character does not do the merchandising opportunities like video games and toys. You even see that when you see the Toy Story movies and Woody is played by Tom Hanks, his brother Jim Hanks is the one that does the video games and any of the action figures that are involved that involve voice activation. And then we've seen even with Buzz Lightyear and Star Command, it was not Tim Allen, at least for the TV series. It was for the movie. It was a different actor there. So Chris Evans getting so much bad hype was just a little bit nonsense. And I think if people had that mindset of thinking like that, I think maybe more people would have seen it at that point. But then also, I think the biggest factor of this is that this was the very first movie to hit theaters after the pandemic had happened, which Onward kind of got screwed over because it was only in theaters for a week before the state of emergency happened and was forced to close the theaters. With things starting to open at around that time, people were still skeptical of like, do I want to be around people to watch this movie or just wait until it obviously released this past August on Disney Plus and just watch it in the comfort of my home. So it was a lot of factors like that that played to why I think it was not profitable or it was profitable, but not as profitable as I feel like it should have been. Overall, I thought it was a pretty good movie. Very strong first half. It was a very strong movie, the way they kicked off. A very emotional beginning with Buzz. And then I felt the second half of the film was a little weak. There was something about it that just fell a little flat. And this is coming from a guy who's a mega Toy Story fan, and I'm saying this. There's something about it, and especially I'm still to this day not really entirely on board about the whole Zerg plot twist. And I mean, it gives me the thought of like, okay, was this really the movie that Andy seen in, let's say, 1995 before he got the action figure for his birthday in the first Toy Story film? Or could it have been super different if this was made in, let's say, 1994, 1995 before Toy Story was released? Uh, As terms to the tomato and audience score... I'm going to have to go audience score because I do think around an 85, maybe 84, 83 is where I would put it because I think 75 is a little too low in my opinion. I guess the first thing that you got to talk about is some of the people that didn't really want to watch the movie because it wasn't the voice actor that they wanted. And that is ridiculous because the Buzz Lightyear in this movie and the Buzz Lightyear in Toy Story are two different characters. They are not the same character. Maybe you could argue that the toy that is made for this franchise should sound like it, but that also goes to the other point where literally what Toy Story does with Woody is that it's not even the same voice actor for the merchandise, which makes a lot of sense to me. So that's ridiculous. But besides that point, the opening of this movie was insane to me. I didn't really expect it. And it really sent like shivers down my whole body. I got chills. And that is right at the beginning where it says in 1995, a boy named Andy received a Buzz Lightyear action figure for his birthday based on his favorite movie. This is that movie. And then the movie starts. I got chills. It was insane. I was so happy to see that. And I thought it was unbelievable. Yeah, the first half of the movie started out really strong. And then right around the middle of the movie, it started getting kind of slow. And I was like, okay, I don't know if I enjoy this. But then the end of the movie, I thought, okay, here it comes. This is it. This is awesome. I am a little skeptical on whether or not I do like that turnaround with Zerg being old buzz. But overall, I did really enjoy Lightyear. I'm going to have to watch it again because, I mean, you got to do that with Toy Story films or at least films from that franchise. 
All right, going to the Funko Pops, which there's still a decent amount here. The Buzz Layer XL01, which is just simply him in a outfit when he's trying out the XL01, which is the ship that he first rides when he does the whole testing. And then there's also a Glow in the Dark Amazon exclusive version of that same pop. The Buzz Layer with XL15 attire that is holding socks. Izzy Hawthorne's Junior Zap Patrol version, which is obviously the granddaughter of Alicia Hawthorne, a space ranger who worked side by side with Buzz Lightyear, Socks, a robotic cat, and Buzz's personal companion. So there's a regular version, and there's also a Funko Shop exclusive flocked version. Zerg, obviously the main antagonist of the movie, a realistic version of Zerg. And then, yeah, later to be Buzz Lightyear from an alternate future. And then last but not least, a recently released pop is a Funko Shop exclusive Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger Alpha attire. These are some pretty cool pops. I don't think we really needed the Glow in the Dark Amazon exclusive, or it could have been vice versa. They could have ditched the common version of that pop, since that is a shelf sitter at a lot of stores, and just kept the Glow in the Dark Amazon exclusive. XL15 attire is pretty cool because it's a bit of a pop and buddy where he is holding socks. Izzy Hawthorne, that pop is all right. I mean, maybe a different version of her would have been better. Socks is awesome. Having a normal one and a flocked version is pretty sweet. I have both of them because I'm trying to get that entire set. The only one I am missing actually is the Amazon exclusive, but I'm not in a rush to get that. The Zerg is really cool. It's actually our first Zerg since the original Zerg from the Disney lineup. I mean, I would have rather seen like Toy Story version of Zerg be made before this one, but this is still fine and I'm glad to have it in my collection. And then Space Ranger Alpha Buzz Lightyear is really cool. I was hoping there would be a pop of Buzz Lightyear in like this movie's take of the classic Buzz Lightyear attire and especially him showing his hair since you do see his hair in this film. This is an awesome wave of pops and I do want to see a couple more but i do like what we've gotten so far with some of these different spacesuits for buzz it was really interesting to see these before watching the movie and thinking like hmm this is interesting that we're not seeing that classic suit that we're so used to seeing which we knew was going to be in the movie because how could they skip out on that these socks pops are pretty cool the flocked one awesome flocking is always sweet especially when it makes a lot of sense the zerg is pretty cool it's neat to see this new take on what zerg looks like and awesome to get a new zerg pop like dk said we hadn't seen one since that original one which is now uh, a pretty decent grail at this point so yeah this is this is a sweet zerg pop i wouldn't mind maybe seeing like a glow in the dark one in the future i don't know why they didn't just make this one glow in the dark to begin with and then lastly you have the buzz lightyear with the space ranger alpha suit and yeah this is really cool glad that they went with the showing of the hair so that it didn't seem too similar to a Toy Story Buzz Lightyear pop. All right, guys. So that is all 26 Pixar films between both of the parts of the podcast. But now we are going to talk about what Funko Pops we want to see now for the Disney Pixar lineups. And I mean, for my list, which I'm actually going to start with mine because I know that I don't have that much compared to probably what MD has listed. I wanted to stay away from Toy Story and Monsters, Inc. because we had already went over those in our fandom-related podcast we have done previously. And I have six pops listed. My first one I kind of cheated on because it's a Pixar character, but it's not from the 26 feature films. And I want to acknowledge this in a Pixar podcast, and that's Luxo Jr., the mascot of Pixar, you can say, where he is the lamp. And I think how they should do this pop is make it a common glow in the dark pop like they did with the glow worm, because I mean, it makes sense to have a lamp always being on. Next pop I have here is Hopper from A Bug's Life. I think this is a character that should have been made with that set of A Bug's Life pops. I think Hopper is one of the best villains in all of Pixar. Not the best, but I think one of the best. And I don't think a lot of people talk about Hopper per se. Next one I've listed is Gil from Finding Nemo. This is the fish that is voiced by William Dafoe in the fish tank at the dentist's office, the kind of older fish with the scarring. I think it'd be really cool to have him, especially because of William Dafoe, who was fresh off of playing Green Goblin at this time. 
I couldn't leave this podcast without mentioning a Coco Pop because we were talking about Coco's five-year anniversary and what inspired this. I wrote down a Pop Deluxe of Grandma Coco herself in like her rocking chair. I think with the way that Funko does pops nowadays, you could really do a nice molding of Grandma Coco. Next pop I've listed is Massimo from Luca. I think this is a pop that would be really cool where you have the cut off arm and even the way I wonder how they would do the eyes because they always look like they're partially closed because of his big bushy eyebrows. So it'd be really cool if they did do a pop of Massimo in the near future. And then last but not least, I thought I'd mention a pop from Lightyear, even though I mentioned about Toy Story, not mentioned it, but this technically is not Toy Story, it's a spinoff. And I put the robot socks from the alternate universe you see near the end of the movie. I think it'd be really cool if they made this pop somehow, three specifications, flocked, metallic, and glow-in-the-dark, so you can have the eye glow-in-the-dark, the robotic piece is metallic, and you have the fur still being flocked from what you normally see with the orangey color of socks. Okay, so for my list, I picked one pop for each movie, not including Toy Story and Monsters, Inc., because we had already discussed about multiple pops that we wanted to see for each of those franchises. So starting out with A Bug's Life, Popper, just like DK had said, I mean, the main antagonist, I don't understand how he wasn't part of that first wave for Finding Nemo, and that is Pearl, who is the little squid Next up, I have a pop for the Incredibles lineup, and that is Mrs. Incredible in her like OG uniform where she has the red eye bandana and kind of like the gray and red attire. And it would be a glitter specification because that attire is glitter, actually a pop that makes sense to be glittered. Next up, I have a pop for the Cars film, Fillmore, one of my favorite characters from cars i think he was awesome he's like the volkswagen like hippie van i think that that would be so cool next up i have a pop for ratatouille and that is chef skinner what a weird looking little guy i think that a pop would be extremely detailed of skinner and i think it would look pretty dang funny as well then i have a pop for wally captain b macria i mean that would be so cool i would like to see a couple of the different humans made into pop form because I think that Funko could really nail their like obese stature. Next up is Up, and I picked Charles Muntz, but not only just Charles Muntz, it would be a chase version where it's the younger version. Then the pop that I picked for Brave is actually the Witch. I can't believe there isn't a witch pop. It could be a deluxe pop where she could be making the potion or she could be doing some wood carvings. Then I had to pick a pop for Inside Out, and this is kind of tough, but I picked Riley because it is simply just a human character, but it's one that we kind of need because it's basically the main character. Next up, I have a pop for The Good Dinosaur, and that is a moments pop of Henry, and it would be glow-in-the-dark in a special way. He's using his tail to light up the fireflies in the grass, so there would be like a kind of splatter effect of green glow paint, which I think would look really awesome. Then the pop for Finding Dory that I picked is Destiny. Destiny was a really cool character. I think it possibly could be a six inch pop considering the size of the character. Then I picked a pop for Cars 3. I didn't pick a pop for Cars 2 because we're just going to forget about that movie. But Cars 3, I picked Jackson Storm. I like the design of this car and I think he's deserving of a pop. Then for Coco, I also picked Mama Coco or Grandma Coco. I think that a pop would look great, just like how DK had described it. Then for Incredibles 2, I actually have a five pack of the rest of the second rate superheroes. I really like them. I thought they were a cool way to bring in more characters into Incredibles 2. And we've seen Void, which I loved that pop. So a five pack of the other five, I think would look so cool. Then for Onward, I had picked Colt Bronco. He is like a centaur, I believe. So I think this would be cool. It would probably have to be in a sideways box, which is a little bit unfortunate, but he's a cool character and I think a pop would look awesome. Then for Soul, I have Moonwind with the sign in his human form. I don't know why this wasn't made because that'd be an awesome looking pop. Then for Luca, I have a variation of Luca that would be half transition from coming from the water to land. I'm surprised Funko didn't do this because it just seems like something that they would want to do. Then for turning red, I have a Malin pop with brown hair. I think brown hair makes sense. I'm surprised that we didn't see a brown haired one. We see the red hair. 
And then lastly, for Lightyear, I have Zerg slash Future Buzz. I do think we will see this in the future, no pun intended, but it just makes sense to see that gray-haired Buzz with just the black clothes on. Anyways, guys, that is going to be the end of this Pixar pod. If you enjoyed this, make sure you smash that like button. Comment in the comment section below and let us know what do you want to see next in the Pixar lineup. Press the subscribe button for more content like this podcast and any other videos we do on this channel in the future. And press the little bell beside it to be notified of when that future content gets released. And if you guys haven't yet, follow us on all of our social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at a Funko Podcast. It'll be listed in the description below. But anyways, guys, thank you for listening to both parts of the Pixar podcast here on a Funko Podcast. And we hope to see you guys next time. One, two, three, I'm out of here. Where should I put my shoes? You say, put them on your head. Peace in, peace out.